Welcome, everyone, to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea. And today we're coming at you with a new set of reviews for two new albums. We this week are going to be covering. First up, we're talking about the new album from podcast review uh, veteran Backwash. We're talking about her new record i lie here buried with my rings and my dresses i think that's the right nailed order it. Nailed it. okay cool um it's it's awesome when i remember that i don't remember what the other fucking album we're talking about is oh it's the new album from power metal. i guess power metal outfit halloween their album halloween Indeed. And we are going to be talking about uh, the next uh, record in our Radiohead retrospective this week. Look out uh, a couple days after this episode goes up for our episode on the Benz, the sophomore <laughs> effort. More, more good and an admirable impression there. So just to clarify, I think we have like a reasonably consistent release schedule at this point. We might as well kind of make it hard coded. Um, so you, this video obviously goes out on Sunday. The Record Club goes out on Tuesday, I think. And then the Radiohead Retrospective is Thursday. So there's like a two-day gap between those videos. And we've actually had, um, it's been kind of important to set a, a system like that up because we've actually been dropping a lot of content recently as well, as you might notice if you're subscribed to the channel. Speaking of which, two videos that went up very, very recently include we started a series where Tyler, myself, Morgan, and Davey play Doki Doki Literature Club. First episode of that is up right now. We are it going is, to be it is, released. Sorry, finish. And I'll no, go ahead. I, mean, I was going to say it is the most chaotic thing that has ever been put on. Well, when it is complete, when the full scope of it is seen, <laughs> it will be the most chaotic endeavor it, that this it, channel it's has amazing ever undertaken. Because you say that. And you still don't know what happens next. And I'm so excited. It already is. We're like, it's yeah. We're but like, I, I just love that we've managed to find a person who doesn't know the deal with this game and the, the, the absolute rabbit hole you go down when playing it. And you're just like, oh, this is where we are now. Yeah. So my, hmm. my understanding is like, we're about, I guess we're into the second act of the game. Uh, I don't. I, know. I'd say we are about at the final third of the game. Oh, okay, cool. So I, I, I don't really know, but like, um, <laughs> this series, the series, <laughs> because this game is such a whirlwind, and because Morgan, Jake, Davy, and myself are actually acting out all of the characters, yep. it's going to be quite a, a long series. So buckle in, uh, get some, get a fucking, get a fucking your your beverage of choice. Yeah. And that's the strongest cocktail you can manage. I, 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 hope, uh, I hope I hope there's no method acting involved. I mean, well, <laughs> look, it depends on how far you want to go with method, but um, it's yes. fair to say that some of us draw from traumatic experiences in the process of. <laughs> <laughs> look, I'm not saying in the last episode that I delivered a genuinely uh, powerful performance, but I delivered a genuinely powerful performance. No, no, no. Both you and and Morgan have on separate occasions moved me to tears <laughs> while, rec <laughs> while recording and, this. And, and it's worth noting, I can't speak for jake although i know he he did imbibe at some point or another in that series i have i spent not a minute of the video that you see on youtube or the videos after uh sober oh i don't uh, think any of us were really sober. oh yeah the the first point. night i was drunk the whole time and the second time i was high the whole time so yeah, yeah. just yeah. so uh, just unbelievably shit-faced um, yeah, so um, I think I was concerned for you at one point, Morgan. Yes, so stick well, yeah, I, 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 I thought I was going to choke on my own vomit at some point. <laughs> oh, but God, I, that's I, right. <laughs> I only just threw up in my mouth a little bit, so it like it, it was cool. It's fine. And uh, on the further note of things being uploaded this week, I also uh, recently put up an interview uh, that my friend friend of the channel uh, Luke at Werner Bertzog on Twitter. Uh, conducted with me about my book series if you are at all curious about that little series or if you want to know what is going on next he conducted a a stellar interview where we had lots of fun talking about shit and uh, that's up right now so if you haven't go gone and seen that go and see that look there's Sersha has a visual aid 
Look at that. Do. Beautiful Look work. at that. Mine is over on the shelf the just behind me. Um, but All so right. be- before we move on, one more thing I want to shout out is that uh, on Twitter this week, we our, our Twitter account, if, which if you're not already following, is at James T Pod, uh, passed 200 followers, which was an awesome moment. And I promised um, that when we had 199 followers, I promised that the 200th follower would get a shout out on this episode. And so here I am shouting them out. Our 200th follower is Boolin McNasty. Uh, Twitter user Boolin McNasty, his at or their at is uh, at Tramsies. Um, their profile picture is a picture of them looking incredibly depressed, smothered between two large legs. So um, they seem like a God, fun time. Man, me too. <laughs> they seem like a fun time. <laughs> so hit them up. Wow. Go go and follow them. Um, and thanks to Bolt, Mr. McNasty, for his generous follow of our uh, Twitter account. We're hoping to keep building those Twitter numbers as well because we're very active mm-hmm. on that account. So yes, follow if you are not already. But enough of all of that. Let's kick off as we usually do with what we've been listening to for the last seven days. Jake, what have you been listening to? Well, um, other than a plethora of records that came out uh, today, uh, and, you know, yesterday, if you're vigilant, uh, uh, but we're all probably going to be talking about the podcast, so I won't really mention any of them, but I, I have been consuming lots of new music uh, today and yesterday, um, but I have some other stuff that I listened to. I listened to uh, psychedelic uh, drone folk album or band, uh, Current 93s. Uh, all the pretty little horses, aka oh, the shit. inmost light. Um, I loved it. Uh, that record is fucking fantastic, and I have had the refrain of "all the pretty little horses" stuck in my head ever since I heard it. It's fine. I'm fine. I'm I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm stellar. Um, oh, but shit. that album is well first of all it's notable because it features a spoken word passage on the last song from a one mr nick cave and um honestly i feel like that in and of itself is enough of a descriptor for you to know like what the deal is with that album but it's it's a very like it has this really arresting colorful um vocal performance by uh the lead vocalist i don't know his name but he has uh, a very heavy accent and he's just got a very animated way of performing. That's like, it kind of gets that you, you got to sort of like, it, it's not like a huge bar for entry or anything, but it's kind of like Tom Waits where you're just kind of thrown off immediately of just being like, oh, uh, okay. Eh, this guy talks like this, I guess, for this whole album. But like, once you let it like really hit you, that is a fascinating album. Uh, lyrically, it's a fucking fever dream it sounds like the entire thing is like a recorded from like the book of revelations from the bible and he's like relaying to you all of this apocryphal imagery and shit and and it's just so like but it's also like really really rooted in that like folkiness so that sort of psychedelic drone part of their sound is really more of like an accent to the sound which I think really makes it a accessible and b just kind of fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would highly, I I genuinely think that pretty much every member of this podcast would get along with that album, particularly Sersha, I would say. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that would be a genuine hit with everybody. Yeah. And I didn't know this, but I looked at their discography, and holy shit, they apparently have a lot of very good albums. So mm-hmm. I'm very interested in checking out the rest of their catalog. Other than that, uh, the other like big thing that I've been getting into this week is that I have been listening to Spoon. Uh, I've been watching a lot of videos by one Mr. Mike the Snare, who cited them as his favorite band and cited uh, Ga 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 as his favorite album. And I was just like, I wonder why he says that, just because it's like, this seems like a strange uh, band to latch onto so strongly. I guess I better see what this is uh, all about. And first of all, I I did take a listen to uh, Ga 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 Ga. Uh, I turned that shit on and was just kind of like, oh, wow, damn, this sounds really, really great and really like detailed for uh, something that, you know, came out in the like, you know, late seventies or early eighties. And then I looked at the album and it was just like release date 2007. And I was like, uh, fucking what? Because the album and just the overall sound and vibe of Spoon is generally like very just classic rock. Like that's just the only way I can broadly describe what the genre they largely inhabit. Um, 
Uh, I got a lot of vibes, particularly from uh, Exile on Main Street era stones, um, except like a lot better. Uh, and they sort of use the fact that, you know, they are a more modern band uh, to their advantage because of how absolutely fucking incredible the production is on both of the albums I've heard. I've heard uh, Gaga Gaga Gaga, which is fucking fantastic. And the album that I actually narrowly prefer to it, which is They Want My, uh, they want my Soul, which, and They Want My Soul is just like, I, 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 I like, if you ask just like, what is the ideal like rock album for you? I'd probably say this. It, it's just got like everything I look for when uh, like, it's not, you know, it's not hard rock. It's not something that's like super intense. It's not going to, you know, like blow you away or anything. Um, I would uh, fucking get somebody get the sign or the pillow or whatever. It's just like, they're definitely a lot closer to a soft rock act like Steely Dan than they are to something like, you know, Van Halen or something a little bit more intense with like metal tinges. But like, this is just good classic rock. And it sometimes it has little tinges. Like there's a lot of uh, psychedelic tinges on They Want My Soul. Uh, the sound play on that album is really, really like dense and deep. And the songwriting on both of them is just fed fucking tastic like there's so much to dig into with these and you just put them on and it's just such a such an immediate uh like immediately accessible and really groovy kind of vibe they've got going on there is such an easy band to enjoy at least for me uh mm -hmm. so i'm going to be listening to every album they've ever made frankly because i love that uh those two records so much and because i have been informed by several reliable people that they simply <laughs> just don't miss so yeah so spoon were i won't i promise i won't hijack for too long but um spoon one of my favorite bands when i was about 17 i uh, got i got really into them i presume i probably got into them in a similar way that mike the snare did and i had I had a similar kind of raging passion for them at that time and i spent some prompted by jake i spent some time re-listening to a lot of their records this week and they still absolutely slap i think what's interesting about those reference points that you bring up is that like uh, what kind of unifies all of them is that it's kind of hard to find a single band to compare Spoon to because they're yeah. so familiar yet different is a good way of describing yeah. them. Um, but I think what underpins what underpins a lot of the reference points is that they're a very rhythm focused band. Um, like the rhythm section in Spoon is crucial. Like and and mm -hmm. in many cases, especially in some of their earlier records, as I'm sure you'll discover, um, the rhythm section is kind of what the songs are oriented around and build from. Um, and so if you really like uh, funk influenced rock music, if you really like rock music with a strong emphasis on the bass and the drums, if you like mm -hmm. rock music that has like really angular guitar parts that are kind of, it's like in many ways, it's almost like uh, Exile era Rolling Stones if they were covering Talking Heads, for instance. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. kind of like a fusion of that classic rock sound with something that's a little more uh, even like post punky or angular or strange, but always like kind of mm. really bright and sunny. Uh, and the cool thing about Spoon is that they're an incredibly consistent band. Like I'm pretty sure they were Metacritic's highest rated band of all of the 2000s. Um, and they're, so they're a very consistent band. They don't really dramatically change their sound very much at all with a couple of minor exceptions. But what they do do is on every record, they do something weird they kind of push their sound in a really weird direction like or they they without you know straying from the core of what they are and that's what makes them really cool is that you listen to a record like ga 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 and you have so many like great straightforward rock pop songs on that record and you also have stuff like ghost of you lingers which is this really ethereal um uh, and that's the other thing is that this is a very piano driven band as well and like yeah again people that. forget that the piano is a percussion instrument and spoon is a hundred percent a band that uses the piano in that way in the same sense as the rest of their rhythm section um and fun, also fun fact the album title Ga -ga 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 comes from the piano uh staccato piano melody in that song <laughs> um but anyway uh yeah so there's like and they always do interesting things they always keep their sound fresh um yeah, I, I'm so excited to hear your reactions to each of these records, Jake. I think you'll have some really interesting responses. There are particular ones that I'm particularly interested to hear what you have to think about, but I won't say what they are. Uh, and also, apparently, I discovered this while doing a bit of reading. Apparently, they mostly finished their new record before the Ooh. pandemic started, but then they were unable to finish it because of the pandemic. And so they're 
new record is currently in a state of when the hell will it come out so hopefully mm. we will get to review them at some point sometime soon on this podcast because they're such a, a great band to talk about and they're such yeah. an easy band to listen to oh yeah absolutely I, I think the great way to describe them is just they're a great fundamentals band they're just they're very well-rounded everything about them and and the production too i just think is like the two of the albums that I listened to are just generally two of the best produced rock albums I've ever heard. Uh, it, it's so layered. Like you can just sort of take it at face value, but you like sit down and really listen, especially with that uh, uh, lossless and Apple digital mastering. Oh man, I really benefited from that because they want my soul. It's just, it's, 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 it's crisp. It's good. Um, but yeah, I've been spinning uh, both of those albums just because I had uh, a really great time with them, and I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to listen to all of that. Uh, another album I revisited, sort of, I can't even really remember why. Uh, we, we got to talking about Iron Maiden the other day in the chat, and uh, Brave New World was brought up, so I was just like, you know, I haven't listened to Maiden in a good fucking while, and I really fuck with Brave New World. Uh, and I, I believe I said something along the lines of like the eventually one day Brave New World will probably be my favorite Iron Maiden album. And that day is not today. I'd still say Power Slave and um, Somewhere in Time, uh, Basic Take as that may be, are ahead of that album. Uh, that said, I, I'd say Brave New World is probably a comfortable third for my favorite Iron Maiden record. It's it's just, oh man, what a good way to make like a, to bounce back uh, from an album that wasn't super well received and some decisions in the band that uh, weren't uh, looked over well uh, in hindsight. But um, man, that's just like, I, I can think of no reason why any fan of the band in any capacity wouldn't think that album is anything short of excellent. It's just all the songs are super robust. All the riffs are great. Uh, it's just a solid experience from A to B to C. And uh, yeah, I, I really like it. And I love how like it, it kind of embraces the inherent silliness of a lot of the subject material that they cover a little bit more with like the whole Brave New World like concept and everything. And I, I really get by with that shit. Like the lyrics are just kind of like, this this wouldn't be out of place on like a Rush album or something. So like, it's it's just it's just good shit. What can I say? Uh, but generally people like that album. So, you know, give it its due. Go listen to it. Um, I have brought up this album on the podcast before, but I have been listening to it a lot recently just because I've kind of been inhaling a lot of punk music just because lately, I, I guess. I guess that listen to Insomniac really sent me on a fucking journey. Uh, but I listened, I re-listened to for the fucking umpteenth time, Let It Be by The Replacements. Uh, which is uh, perfect. I, I have finally given that the 10 that it deserves. Um, it, it's weird just because it's like, it's such a scrappy, um, like it, it is an album that does not give a shit whether or not you think it's perfect. It's just being fun and that's why it's perfect. Uh, but it's like, you know, it's not this monumental fucking thing. It's just like, you listen to it and you're just like, God damn, every single song on here just whips and every, like the vocal performances, there, there's just not a thing about that album that I don't completely fucking love. I, 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 I need to listen to all of the replacements because I've only mm -hmm. just heard that and I think pleased to meet me, uh, which is also fantastic, but I mean, God damn, let it be though. Yeah. Yes. We're August doing his best Richard D. James face. Yeah, all right. So this week, uh, first thing I listened to was uh, the monthly uh, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard album, uh, <laughs> Butterf <laughs> Butterfly 3000. This is the worst thing I've ever heard from them. It's, <laughs> the synthesizers are obnoxious. The, uh, Would you call them tinny? I would consider that descriptor but considering the meme status that word has gained gained amongst us i would not uh the vocals are obnoxious and yeah it it sucked it was stupid i hated it i'm glad we didn't review it uh moving on uh from it sucks uh, and is everything. also bad yeah moving on to uh an three things IDM. in his life three things in Artists. his life are certain death taxes and another fucking king gizzard album yep yep next thing from uh idm artist rival consoles i listened to oh. the album persona uh i i liked it a fair bit i wouldn't 
say I quite loved it as much as I was hoping to, but I that doesn't because, surprise me. <laughs> yeah, it, it's more it, like a minimal techno sort of thing that I yeah, wouldn't have paid you to be too interested in. But I'm pleased no. you checked it out. Uh, a friend's dad actually <laughs> recommended it to me and passed it my way, so I was like, sure, I'll give it a listen. And it, I, I get the. I see the appeal. It's just not for me necessarily. Yeah. It's not an amazing record. I agree, but it was funny about you getting getting recommended to you in that way. Is that that's a, a rare example of a new record that my dad actually recommended to me. He usually oh, likes is much worse at keeping up with new music than me. But, he, but every so often he'll message me and say, "Have you heard this?" And it'll be something like that, and I'll be like, "Okay, uh, yeah. I'll give it a can listen." He, can he say this? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Um, yeah. Next dad thing. works at Techno. Yeah. <laughs> I wish dad yeah. works at Law Tecker. He's in the PR department. <laughs> I, won't, I won't speak to my dad for like three months, and out of the blue, he'll just send me a, a, an IDM album with no <laughs> context. Boy, have you heard Incanabula? <laughs> Boy. <laughs> Boy. Why is his dad, why is his dad Kratos from God of War? <laughs> It was just the funniest Boy. thing I could think of for me. Like, imagine what the funniest voice is for addressing your son for IDM music. And it's just like, I said IDM music, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> like we. Uh, it looks like your drink is going to kill you. Yeah. Drinking kills, kids. Uh, no, next I'm thing. A, I'm a gay eating Chick fil A. So it's amazing. I'm, I haven't spontaneously combusted. <sighs> yeah. Homophobia is so real. You- I would think they would put like the anti-gay stuff in there. You know, the like weed killer, is it? Love that play, anti-gay. I love love, uh, unintentional bars. Uh, Anyways, from Pauline Oliveros, Stuart Dempster, and however the fuck you say this other guy's name. You made all of those names up. I I listened to the album uh, Deep Listening. This is a... (laughs) Uh, staple in the kind of drone ambient genre, dark ambient. So naturally I had to uh, give this a checkout and I thought it was quite good. There's the textures here are really haunting, uh, forlorn and just really dark. And I think it's just an absolutely necessary listen if you're into this kind of music. Uh, it, it really struck me as this brooding, really emotional piece. And I, I look forward to spending even more time with it. Right on. I look forward uh, to hearing it. Yeah. Uh, next thing from a group we're reviewing this week, I listened to Halloween's Keeper of the Seven Keys albums. I... I had heard these before, uh, like once back in February. So this was kind of a rediscovery in a sense. And the <laughs> whole final thing from Dinosaur Jr. I listened to uh, Where You Been. Uh, this is a really uh, rockin' release from them in that it's their, I think, kind of most straightforward rock-oriented album I've heard from them. Uh, and I think this is maybe my favorite thing I've heard from them. I really like a lot of the immediacy and directness and the longing in uh, the lyrics and vocals here. Uh, and a lot of these songs like uh, Out There and uh, Start Chopping have just these really immediate catchy grooves that are so easy to sink into and get lost. And I think it absolutely, uh, it has a similar but different appeal to their like first, to like uh, you're living all over me and bug. Uh, But it's still, I think, obviously I think it's really great. Uh, Yeah. Really just two albums that I will bring up uh, in this segment. I want to first listen and the other a re-listen of an album that I hadn't heard in a long time. Uh, the latter of which being an album called Strangers Almanac by a band called Whiskey Town. 
Now, Whiskey Town may ring a faint bell to you because it was yeah. the band that uh, uh, one Ryan Adams was in before he went solo, before Heartbreaker. Oh. And, you know, I'll uh, go ahead and start. Fuck Ryan Adams. That said, Stranger's Almanac is perfect. <laughs> I don't feel so bad saying that because there were, in fact, other contributing members of the band. So, you know, and I don't think their work deserves to go go unsung because Ryan Adams is a, is a lecherous shit sack. But it's just, a, you know, late 90s alternative country and it's like I fucking several just all timer tracks on there for me. Um, it's funny that you should bring that up because I was listening to uh, the most recent, well, like last week's episode of IndieCast, they brought up Ryan Adams and the context of the fact that he just released a new record and oh. there was absolutely no press for this record anywhere. Like <laughs> no publications picked this up. Barely anyone at all reviewed it. And it's like, it's interesting, an interesting example of how an artist who was once like a fixture of, of a certain uh, area of alternative music has just been completely blacklisted, um, which obviously deservingly so he's a piece of shit and his music's not good anymore anyway but um but it's just an interesting example of like how uh like some even, sometimes when like shit sacks are still putting out music you're you're aware of that because of the cult that they've gathered but like no one in the world yeah. like it's it sold about as many copies as robin thick's paula this new um brian adams album and it's just a funny example of how how um powerful yeah, like that that can, coverage can be it just like nobody nobody cares enough about ryan adams anymore to really put up a fight like not even the fucking alt-right weirdos you know that would be <laughs> hanging around a, an artist that has had a controversy like this like when tucker no, carlson gets ariel pink on fox news but not someone like ryan adams that's a really damning condemnation right there well, yeah, I mean, because he would probably be, like, outspokenly against Fox News, but that doesn't make him any less of a fucking sex pest, so. Correct. Morgan, they also have a song called Paper Moon that I'm familiar with on their third album that I think is really great, but I don't know anything about them other than that. I just knew, like, I was like, I knew fucking Whiskey Town from something. Morgan, would I like Whiskey Town if I thought that Heartbreaker was mid? Oh, I, I kind of think Heartbreaker's mid, too. Oh, okay. So I, well, that makes me feel better. Know, give it a stab. Maybe I will. And the other album stab. that I listened to, the first listen, was uh, Built to Spills Keep It Like a Secret. Another perfect album. Um, just a, like, what what to say? If you've heard it, you know. If you don't, you should hear it. Because Morgan, they what's invented, a built to spill? They, it's the guys who invented the guitar. So oh. it's, uh, yeah. Oh. I don't, yeah. Another band that was a huge, uh, hugely influential on my music taste as a teenager. The, if not for Yola Tingo, I would say this is the greatest uh, indie rock band of, of the 90s, maybe all time. Um, and certainly one of the most consistent, like they've never made a dull album or even a mid album, all their albums are good. Uh, and the three records they made between 1994 and 1999 are three of the best rock albums of all time. Keep it like a secret being one of them. Um, yeah, incredible band. Like Morgan says everything. I couldn't put a better than Morgan. If you like the sound of guitars, you are depriving yourself by not listening to this band. Um, yeah, incredible. Where to uh, start? Let, yeah, keep it like a secret's a good place to start. Um, okay. Th but the record that gets the most attention from them is the one that actually comes before it, which is called Perfect From Now On, which has got like, a, uh, I was stunned to learn this week that record has like a 4.03 on um, Radio Music from like tens Ooh, of no. thousands of ratings. Uh, I, didn't, yeah. I, w I wasn't aware of how beloved that record actually is, but it deserves it. It is like a prog indie opus. Um, uh, amazing. Oh. Great band. 
and 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 as Morgan will, I'm sure, agree, "Carry the Zero is simply one of the greatest songs ever written. Uh, yeah, there's like there's like at a minimum three of those on that album. So, fucking okay. So, I've been listening to a lot of uh, driving albums this week. Uh, the very first thing I did was I put on my CD of Loveless by my bloody Valentine um, and hit the road. Um, oh boy, that like when you get your driver's license for the first time, that like sense of freedom with that huge like shoegaze pop sound. It's exactly what you want. Um, and then the next day, not, not a first lesson, but a first lesson since it came out for me. Uh, you won't get what you want by daughters um f- maybe like a perfect sort of noise post punk record um it's just driving- the best yeah driving to it ripped my scalp off <laughs> I, I, I i was i was i was seriously wondering Wig if snatched. i'd have to explain to <laughs> i was seriously wondering if the I'd, I'd have to stand in front of a judge and say your honor the reason i was speeding was because i was listening to this daughter's record and it was just so intense and man. knocking and knocking and knocking oh, and knocking, and knocking, and knocking. <laughs> don't tell me how to do my job <laughs> wow eric andre <laughs> I was actually uh, uh, channeling a bit. Of I love guitars that sound like razor wire. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the reason they hate me is like one of my favorite songs of all time now. Mm-hmm. Um, just immaculate shit. Um, another noisy, uh, another noisy punk record I listened to this week was um, "Deep Fantasy" by White Lung. Oh fuck yes. Um, I have a feeling everyone on this podcast would love that record. Um, Draw with the monster! (laughs) There is simply not a song in the record that doesn't... (laughs) We had an extra Red Bull today. The album does that to you, though, man. Like It's It's only 22 minutes long. long. Yeah, punk. Real shit. Mm -hmm. It's real full throttle. Um... I, everyone on the podcast has a chance of loving it. I really recommend it. It's it's yeah. I think Zach recommended this. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, I know Zach and Tyler both listened to it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's great. I love it. Their um, follow up record as well, Paradise, is very different. I think it's called Paradise. I can't remember. It's very different. Um, yes. But also very underrated. A good, ba- great band. They don't have a miss in them. Um, their records are all superb. But yeah, uh, Deep Fantasy is just just fucking a shot of. Mm-hmm fucking cocaine it's great hell yeah it, it that is exactly what it's like and there isn't a track on it that doesn't have that energy to it man um and yeah i dropped um a re-listen on uh, a personal favorite this week it's gonna be the last track i'm gonna talk about before we get before i'm, I'm done with my segment um a record that people are tired of me talking about but i'm gonna do it one more time this being um Probably nothing, possibly everything by one Mr. Pat Bunny. Um, this is a record that has saved my life on multiple occasions, which is really impressive for a record that's inc- just one guy with a guitar and like an incredibly lo fi microphone. But that's my favorite record. Not that one, but another record recorded like that's my favorite record. Um, and just the way it's a real like mature approach to moving on while still maintaining your sort of um, sensibilities of rebellion is. Um, yeah, it's pulled me out of some of my darkest moments, and I love it. I don't like the record. It's not got Pat the Bunny on it. It anyway. fucking Wait. got it too. Oh, oh, oh my god! Oh. Yeah, god, crazy. Uh, like, was that was that the Mars Volta episode? I don't. It remember. was. What yeah, it was Morgan. Remember. It was Morgan on the Mars Volta episode. Well, well, we joked well, about he Frank said, Turner, and he just goes, "I, I, I don't, don't like this it. Record, it's so not got Pat Frank the Bunny Turner. on it." Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, sorry, I just obligated to use that every time Pat the Bunny is mentioned now, <laughs> and also to um, it's okay, and also to nicely come down from how heavy that record obviously is in terms of what it means to you. Um, but mm-hmm. uh, I'll keep my segment brief. I only really have one thing I want to talk about. Um, I listened to multiple things this week, but I'll just keep it to one thing I want to talk about. What was that snooty fucking <laughs> look? Jake? 
<laughs> I just wanted to see if you were like noticing me. Yeah, sometimes I look at the screen. Um, Notice me, senpai, Jake said. Yep. Look. Tyler is my senpai. You can make any kind, of, at this point, after the things that we've been through, you could make any kind of sexual joke about us and it, we, it would just roll right off the back of us because- I was, we, That was a bit of a leap, Tyler. Do you want me to say something? Are you, are you, are you thinking about something? <laughs> is Morgan gonna, does Morgan have to get jealous? Look, uh, there's, <laughs> there's- Angrily eats waffle fry. He can do what he wants. He yeah. can do who he wants. Exactly. Um, we've been through it. We, we've, um, yeah, it's been real. Uh, <laughs> hmm. So yeah. the, the thing I'm playing <laughs> Doki Doki Literature Club in person this you man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, especially when your friend, when you're playing, the, you're playing the protagonist, and your friends are playing the protagonist's love interest. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's, you know, it creates a certain dynamic, let's say. Um, what do you mean I make you uncomfortable, Tyler? <laughs> let's go. Let's you're a bitch, on. you're dead. Damn, this is, this is oh, like when I... spoilers. Yeah, I have to cut that out now. For <laughs> For viewers, I'll, I'll cut that bit out anyway. Damn, For this, viewers like you. This Thank is you. like Any, when, I, when I watched anybody Hentai with my friends. Anybody. I'm sorry? Anybody who it, just don't. Anybody who... <laughs> That's basically what we did, essentially, really, if you think about it. No. No, actually. I refuse to watch pornography with people around. And that's a little bit of insight into Jake's mind that, you, you know, that we have now. Furthermore, anybody who is going to watch a playthrough of Doki Doki Literature Club knows what happens. Okay, that's fair. why they're that's that's why they're watching it because the, yeah. they're cruel, sadistic sons of bitches. The surprise is how frequently Jake and Morgan and Davey add references to sexual acts in every every single line that they say to me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway. <laughs> anyway. I'm um, so fucked up. <laughs> okay, Shinji. Natsuki's boobs are insanely large. I need more. <laughs> anyway <sighs> anyway um so there's one thing i want to talk about this week just the one um and it is um the mountain goats uh i've been listening a lot to the mountain goats this week um yeah I, there we go i, I figured you'd hear, you'd, you'd, you'd overhear me but um but i have to bring this up because this really was like the the my, my my week was basically defined by this band i've been i've listened to i spent probably something like you know eight hours maybe of the last week listening to them um i listened to most of their records again most of which i've heard by now there's still two major records of theirs that i haven't heard yet um which aside from the new one which is um goths and in league with dragons so i'll be getting to those before the new one as well but um yeah i think it's fair to say that mountain goats are pretty pretty close to if not already one of my 10 favorite bands at this point um, they are just so damn consistent and the, the joys of their records are so dense and, and special and, and, and um, layered and multifaceted. Uh, but specifically what I want to talk about is a record, which I've already mentioned when I first listened to it, The Life of the World to Come, which is one of my, which is probably now my favorite Mountain Goats record, although that's subject to change on a whim, basically. It's a very intimate record. It's, it's kind of quite different to a lot of the other records, um, especially in recent years where the instrumentation has come to the fold. Whereas on Life of the World to Come, the band themselves are, um, you know, sometimes they're really there and they're driving the songs, but for the most part, they're almost invisible. It's very much a song, where an album where John is front and center and he's singing about some very raw topics, um, death, grieving, uh, religion, um, humanity, like is a very, a very broad array of things and he talks about this record and he talks about them in a very intimate and moving way. Um, and specifically what I want to mention is that I watched um, the film, The Life of the World to Come, which is a concert recording uh, where John plays the album mostly solo on piano and acoustic guitar. Uh, and it is shot and directed by Ryan Johnson, one Mr. Ryan Johnson, who of course we're all big fans of on this podcast. And I might go as far as to say that this might be my favorite thing Ryan Johnson has made, um, which, which is not to say like it's the most accomplished <sighs> thing necessarily. 
It's um that is but... I, that is the single most Tyler <laughs> thing that I have ever heard in my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's not for lack of competition at all um he, the thing about I'm ryan johnson saying. is that he consistently bats 100 without exception um but this he may this have th- made somebody's favorite movie of all time well exactly well there, but there's something about this I and bet like, he has. the way he chooses to shoot this uh which actually as i was first starting to watch it was kind of like i wasn't really fully on board with it first like he the thing about it is it's, it's one take he shoots the entire performance which is about 50 minutes long in a single take Pain. which um you know won't take a bit low like it's it's more interesting it's okay when he's doing it it's more interesting than just that because um it's shot in a way that's very uncinematic it's kind of like um if you when you think of concert films and you think of stop making sense uh, which is obviously the greatest film of all time um, and and the life of Ryan Johnson's The Life of the World to Come is kind of like the exact opposite of that. It is not um, dressed up. It is not theatrical. It is not um, huge and larger than life. It is incredibly. Uh, it, it's basically all shot on video, and a lot of it is handheld. Uh, some of it is on a tripod, which is on a roller that goes around circles around John. Uh, and absolutely no attempt is made whatsoever in this concert recording to create the illusion of it being uh, not a recording. You can see the roller, you can see the, the tripod, you can see the, the handheld bits are very janky and you can feel like the camera being moved around and placed. Um, the camera will uh, go right up into John's right into John's face at certain points or it will recede away from him entirely. Um, it'll go back onto the roller, it'll come off the roller, it'll spin around this rolling track, which is constantly visible. So Ryan has directed this uh, in a way where you're constantly, like there's no attempt made to preserve the illusion of the concert film. It is like a very intimate, direct um, document of a man sitting at either at the piano for a couple of songs and at the, or just on a stool with his acoustic for most of it and summoning as john does when he performs summoning something within him that feels uh almost uncomfortable to watch because of how much he's clearly like pulling and pulling from his himself and putting into the songs especially and i think it it would not have worked for most other mountain goats records this, this approach because of um the nature of those records and how they vary but specifically because of the life of the world to come what a lot of those songs are about um, the intimacy of the storytelling in those songs specifically. Uh, it's a beautiful and inspired combination. And I was ab- in a way that I don't think I have been uh, in a long time. I was genuinely like glued to the screen watching this. I couldn't take my eyes off it for a single second. It was mesmerizing. Um, and yeah, so that is now, I think, Again, subject to change because these things are so unfixed, but currently my favorite Mountain Goats record um, uh, and, and an absolutely uh, wonderful document of it. Um, yeah, it, it, absolutely incredible. Um, it, it, regardless of whether you've heard it or not, um, it, the, the film itself is worth watching. It's a very faithful, you know, John performs the songs very faithfully. Like they're essentially it's the same as you hear them on the record for the most part, even though they are more stripped down. Um, but yeah. That was uh, absolutely the highlight of my week in terms of um, watching, listening, anything. Like that was uh, very special. And yeah, it it gets a big thumbs up from me. Uh, And I am looking forward to finishing the Mountain Goats discography in the next seven days. And, um, you know, being able to give a more comprehensive report um, on that. So yeah, amazing stuff. And that's my week. Amen. That was a beautiful talk through of it. Thank you. Hmm. first album what is it fellas okay so the first record we're going to be reviewing today a very hotly anticipated album it is backwash is a rapper uh one of the very first artists that we covered on this channel as um, some of our viewers might know uh, others might not be aware Um, Backwash released her second studio album about a year ago around the time that we started doing this podcast Uh, and it was very much a moment where uh, she uh, suddenly was uh, getting a lot of attention that felt inevitable really Um, pleased to say that I um, 
bit of a backwash OG, been around since Deviancy, but um, but it, I it certainly felt like she came into her own. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> sorry. What? No, he was laughing at me. He wasn't laughing at you. No, no yeah. Jake just did like this. He was like, ugh. <laughs> well, you were saying a bit of a backwash OG and it made me fucking die. Yeah, fair enough. No, that's fair enough. Um, but yeah, so uh, that last record was, you know, she blew up in popularity with that record, essentially. It very much felt like an arrival for her as an artist. And, um, you know, even though things do move a lot more quickly in the hip hop world and they move in... Uh, other realms of music it still I think was a bit of a surprise to hear that she would be following it up as quickly as she is essentially one year later um, with this new record I lie here buried with my rings and my dresses yeah and, and a lot has happened for Backwash since we reviewed that last record of hers um, the perhaps the most notable thing is that um, that record re received Canada's Polaris Music Prize which is the most prestigious music award uh, in Canada and a huge deal uh, and essentially it felt like, wow, all of a sudden Backwash um, went from being, you know, artist to watch to fixture of, um, hip, of alternative hip hop at the very least. And so um, all eyes very much on her to see how she would follow that up. And it's fair to say that, um, you know, we weren't all completely smitten with the last record. I think we all generally agreed that it was good. And some of us were quite passionate about its greatness as well. Um, but I think it's fair to say that uh, regardless of your feelings in that last record, this new record is something else. Um, it is. It feels very much like uh, if um, God has nothing to do with it was a fuller expansion and a more concentrated, focused and in your face record in comparison to the one that preceded it, then I Lie Here Buried um, is like twofold a move forward from even that. Uh, it is uh, bold album it is declarative it is in your face it is dark it is morose it is angry it is um it frequently terrifying even and incredibly gripping as well uh, and i feel like we could we have a lot to potentially say about this record and some of the things that backwash talks about on it and what this moment means for her as an artist at this very kind of crucial time in her career yeah, the thing that epitomizes for me how I feel about this record, and I think what the record is, right, is very soon after that first record came out and Backwash was sort of blowing up off the back of it, uh, she put out a tweet with, like, her bucket list musical wishes, right? Um, one of which was a song to be produced by Clipping, um, which is, it happens on this album, um, yeah. And that that is a great way to sort of talk about what the record, at least for me, what the record is, right? Which is uh, the last one, God had nothing to do with it, leave him out of it, is like announcing yourself on the stage. It's a real short. Um, it's like the Rise of Our Dogs to this album's Pulp Fiction in many ways. Like the first one is really stripped down. It's a calling card. It's the announcement on the scene. And then this one is like, okay, I am now the an artist on the stage i wish to be on what can i do with it um yeah in in many ways um to me i enjoyed that last record a lot in many ways it felt like uh more it felt closer to an ep than a record not that because it was 22 minutes long and not that records can't be that short i know a number of artists now i do put out records that are quite short like that but to me there were a few core highlights on that record but i was left wanting a little bit more and i and feeling that there was an even fuller potential in terms of how she could push her sound uh, and the way that she uh, performs um, that were there were plenty of great glimpses of that on that record but I'm delighted to say that I feel that this new record is exactly what I have wanted and felt that um, Backwash was capable of and you know planning to deliver uh, it's uh, it's absolutely in your face in all the right ways it, it, it marries that uh, very heavy and dynamic and noisy production most of which is it should be said handled by her mm -hmm. herself uh, and so in many ways this record feels like not just a fuller arrival for backwash as a performer um, but also like a, a, an expansion of her abilities as a producer as mm -hmm. well like there are some really creative um, production um, details and um, sonic landscapes that are on this record that have 
um, not to again not to denigrate that previous record, which was very good, but the the weight and the sense of size and scope and and density and the atmosphere of this record is uh, even more of a leap forward as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this also it's worth noting that uh, Backwash herself has said that um, whereas the last record was more directly about sampling sort of metal itself this is uh intentionally moved towards industrial noises um uh i wish to highlight the lead single the titled i lie here buried in my rings my dresses title track with the black metal screams from uh ada rook whose last record we talked about which i like very much um yes. i feel like God, there is so of fucking good yeah. I feel like th there's almost like a kinship there of those industrial sounds spilling over onto that song in the record in general. That's worth noting. That that's also it's what is worth noting a continued collaboration between um, Backwash and Ada because she of course featured on the last record as well. Uh, and of course, I mean, you get Ada Rook on your record, you're sold anyway. Not that the record needs it, but like Ada is such a has particularly at this point in their career where black dresses and Ada's own solo projects are arguably as good as they've ever been and she's kind of at the peak thus far of her abilities and her focus and her um, creative output as a performer you get her doing the screams on this track and it's absolutely blood curdling I think that this song the title track on this record is quite handily the best song that Backwash has made to date so far uh, it is an absolutely incendiary piece of music that chills me to the bone um, though and it is a beautiful amalgam of uh, a lot of the musical details, flourishes, influences, styles that make Backwash such a compelling presence in her specific lane with an alternative hip hop or horrorcore, it should be said specifically as the subgenre she works in. So it's a beautiful, uh, full, um, fully realized potential of her uh, specific style in that realm, as well as some of her most confronting and performances uh, and and best lyricism as well like it should be said that um, Backwash is a writer I mean that was my favorite aspect actually of her last record was the writing itself the actual rapping that she was doing and the things that she was touching on and her ability to um, really emotionally and directly and nakedly talk about some very kind of personal and uh, intimate and and emotionally charged aspects of her life and really render them like huge vivid um and she does that uh with even more gusto on this record as well like um, god it has nothing to do with it clearly a record about um the poisonous uh influence of religion and um the role that religion has played in subjugating um backwash and um, people like her uh in terms of upbringing and cultural background and the relationship with um, queer sexuality as well and trans identity to a very core theme of that record and something that is expanded upon on this record as well and in addition to a number of other particular themes that relate to uh, identity and experience and suffering in particular as well as a huge part of this album uh, in a way that's quite confronting as I've said and um, you know uh, at times difficult to really process especially like this is a record that's total rage you can put it on and just totally fucking rage to it and then the second you start to really pay attention and and dig into it for the purposes of reviewing it it becomes clear pretty quickly how mm. um immensely uh upsetting this album is by design yeah uh, uh on that note i feel like uh, um thematically this album is its own beast in many ways, distinct from God has nothing to do with it. Whereas I feel like that album was a lot to do with like, um, specifically those real life um, ideas of like, sort of the trans experience mixed with religion and trauma. This deals a lot with mental health itself and also sort of racial identity and heritage mm -hmm. um, in ways that I think make it distinct. Uh, like uh, Backwash talks way more about um, her African heritage on this record than they did at all yeah. on yeah. Got Something to Do With It. Uh, the most explicit transgender reference on it isn't even rap by Backwash on this record. That's true. I'm glad that I was going to bring up the verse from Queer Rapper Censored Dialogue on the song Terror Packets, which is one of my favorite verses on the album, honestly. Uh, it's very, um, there's some really raw and intense and emotional lyricism here. Some of the most memorable lines are, where were you at when I had to trap just to pay for my hormones? 
um, was is one line that immediately kind of jumps out at you. Uh, and of course, that um, hook, which is delivered by both uh, backwash and censored dialogue of I am just a dick to these hoes, like really getting in your face about the um, issue of identity and the issue of perception uh, and both within the landscape of, of music and just with generally um, as you know existing as um, trans. Mm. Absolutely. Um, but it, you're completely correct to point out the fact that you can completely enjoy this record as a rager because the beats are so hard, the rapping goes hard as hell, um, mm. and the metal sampling is, if anything, more hair racing than the previous album. Yeah, um, absolutely. It, um, completely agree. Uh, one, and, and in terms of like that, that intensity as well, I also want to shout out the contributions of the contribution of the dark synth artist surgery head on the track whale of the banshee which essentially is um the introduction to the music of the record because the opening track purpose of pain is a sample which actually is um what it's not really to, to, to the same effect but it reminded me of um the famous spoken word uh, art installation uh, i'm sitting in a room by alvin lucia in which uh, i've spoken mm -hmm. i spoke about this in our authentic confield video where it's um this section of speech that is looped over and over and over again until it loses all of its human um, distinctions and the approach of this track is, is not really the same but it reminded me of that in the way that the sample was looped and then overlapped and then um, complicated and uh, it, it obviously putting this particular sample at the beginning of the record as well talking about the purpose of pain in terms of how it hardens you uh, and prepares you for um, uh, future struggles so that you are strengthened by um, the suffering that you've survived is, is quite a potent sort of mission statement. And then you go immediately from that into the, which I think is very carefully placed here, Whale of the Banshee, which is one of the most incendiary tracks in terms of the instrumentation, in terms of the uh, noise on this track because of the surgery head feature. It, it roars the record to life amid those layers of noise. It's a great piece of sequencing. Uh, it's a shorter track but mm. it really um, throws you in the deep end in a way that I really like uh, in that yeah. instance. Yeah. I will Absolutely. say about those sh shorter tracks, um, I, they, they were obvi they've obviously been on both of the backwash albums we've reviewed up to this point. And I do think this album does show like one of my personal biggest improvements of, of this album over the last one is the sequencing because while these two shorter tracks do still kind of bug me that they're there, what I cannot deny is I think their purpose here is much stronger and much more well thought out mm -hmm. than on the last album. Yeah. And I think in that sense, uh, that to me speaks to a really big leap forward over God has nothing to do with it. Yeah, and, and also what I like in terms of the leap forward as well is that the placement of these of short, these shorter, more punchy tracks is less to serve as interludes as you had kind of interludes present on that previous record. And the focus consistently on this record from that, um, for, from that second song onwards is Backwash's lyricism, her writing itself. Like, yes, you have these fantastic instrumentals that are very heavy and incorporate lots of uh, industrial sounds and timbres and textures, but to me, the truest joy and the truest creative triumph of this record is the fact that constantly Backwash as a performer is a completely engaging and um, thoughtful and dense and uh, powerful presence in terms of the things that she is saying about like, the verses that she has consistently fantastic verses, verses on this record. And uh, even in that track, Whale of the Banshee itself, she opens with the lines, my mind's stuck in a torture chamber. It's locked in endangered coats and hangers, ropes that dangle for all to witness. When I was young, I never thought I would call it quits. And now I'm old and I want it all. So Lord, forgive me. Really throwing you into that um, mindset that she's approaching the sound and the feel of this record with, which is this kind of like, I am absolutely on the fucking edge here and I'm going to fucking let rip. I can fuck the consequences. Yeah. I have some shit to say. And that absolutely uh, is impossible to ignore when you're listening to this record. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great attraction to the record for me is that it feels like an album made by someone who knows exactly where they sit in the artistic palette of the world and they just want more of it, you know? 
Um, it feels like an album made by someone who just made God Has Nothing to Do With It to so Leave Me Out of It mm-hmm. and is completely aware of how amazing that record is. Um, I, I do want to touch quickly, because uh, we brought up the opening track, Purpose of Pain, some of the shorter tracks, and I want to talk about something I think that that does is really interesting to do with the fact that like there was spoken word sampling on God Has Nothing to Do With It, mainly on the last track that worked really well. Uh, there's a lot more of it on this record. Um, on the opening track, there's another sampling of a, of a, a religious speech about uh, of a sort of pastor thing. Um, and what I think that opening track does really well um, is it sets up in a way that actually weirdly reminded me of science fiction by Brand New. This recurring idea, it sets it up as a motif um, that is intentionally part of um, the sound palette of this record. So then when really recognizable voices that I, I know and like the character of the voice is really iconic show up in this record, like Angela Davies of yeah. all people. Yeah, I was gonna say she's she shows up yeah. at the end of Terror Packets and gives this quite meaningfully, yeah. uh, meaning, well, there's this quite meaningful speech that she gives about the, um, the, constants and um what's the word i'm looking for like omnipresence of violence and and state sanctioned yeah, violence uh, yeah um, and, and it's, it's a great moment but she has a voice that i is so iconic and characteristic and singular just the way she speaks mm. um so what the recurring sampling of spoken words does from the off is like when it's like oh that's that's is that angela davis but it's not taking you out of the moment because you know this is a motif that's happening yeah, absolutely. Another piece of sampling that I absolutely love on this record, and it's quite meaningful, and then touches on some of the themes of identity and roots that um, Backwash touches on throughout this record is in one of my favorite tracks, which is the shorter track 666 in Lusaksa, which is um, features a, a sample of a traditional Sangoma, which is a Zulu healer uh, chanting that Backwash then chops up into this basically flailing loop of vocal um, sounds to wrap over. It's a shorter track, but it's really impassioned. The title being a reference to Lusaka, which is the capital of Zambia. Um, shout out to uh, uh, Professor Sky there, um, real ones know. Uh, but yeah, so the song refers to the city of Lusaka and then by extension backwashes um, roots and history there. And there's discussion in this song of the poisons of colonialism essentially is, is the um the root of the song and she's there's explicit references in the song to um culture cultural um exorcism and um religious figures and she even makes a specific she has a specific moment even when she calls out justin trudeau as racist um and and so there's a sense of of backwashes reckoning with the ongoing poisons of colonialism both within the place that she is from and in the place that she exists now this kind of perpetual systemic uh hegemony basically that has that continues to oppress her in some sense uh, regardless of where she is based and and the nature of that oppression shifts and is um, often disguised by um, certain traditional institutions like religion, for instance, and and that flows throughout the record that the ideas um, of religion are obviously a very important uh, part of, of backwashes uh, or a key thematic interest of backwash as evidenced by the last record, but also the way it kind of flows through this record. I mean, even in a lot of the titles of the tracks as well, another one that stands out in this regard is um, In Thy Holy Name too. Uh, which is a, a is a great track at the center of this record um, where it, it almost has this kind of like almost diatribe that she goes into in the second half of the track that could, is very on the nose, but also like deserves, it kind of earns that directness that it goes for. Like there's a lot of direct call outs and references to certain figures, uh, including President Joe Biden and, and Jeff Bezos and all these kinds of things. And she really goes off on this track. Uh, um, and what's interesting about that is it is prompted by that sample of the um, demonic priest as it is referenced on genius uh, railing against homosexuality and so that's really interesting uh, another one of my favorite songs on this record just that I want to shout out briefly just in terms of this theme is the track Song of Sinners uh, which has a really great um, really great instrumental has an awesome feature as well from um, Sadie Dupuy of I actually don't know how to pronounce her last name Sadie Dupuy or Sad13 as she calls herself under her solo name 
uh, of the indie rock band Speedy or Tiz. And she sings the hook of this song and also the killer guitar solo from Ada Rook on this track as well. But anyway, the reason I bring it up is it builds off of um, songs like In the Holy Name and Blood on the Water, uh, which Blood on the Water ends with um, this these outro vocals that are basically from the perspective of this malevolent, hateful God where she's pitch shifted her vocals to sound like evil and terrifying and then song of sinners comes in with this hook of i fear love i fear god um and and that's a really interesting like lyrical motif um this notion of like you think of the the classic biblical verse of like god is love and if god is love and religion is used as a tool to subjugate you as backwash has sung and and rapped um, very um, in, in a lot of detail about then love itself becomes a poisonous concept and as a result of that you become consumed by this negative emotion this hate this anger this roiling um, uh, self-destructive uh, mode basically and and so that the way that and this comes again back to sequencing is the way this record flows to introduce these ideas and then build upon them in really creative ways like voicing a malevolent god or like uh, examining or subverting these classic religious um, sentiments is really um, powerful. So I remember when we reviewed God Has Nothing to Do With It, I, uh, the big takeaway for me was something along the lines of, I love what's going on here, and I, I just wish there was much more of it, and it was all much more developed. And uh, e e e th this this is that. Um, this is what I asked for. Thank you, Mrs. Wash. Um, <laughs> yeah, good good ass album. And as if I wasn't already excited enough, it makes me even more excited for what they'll do after this. Because as as great as this album is, as exciting as it is. There's more leveling up to do. I can feel it. It sings on this record. It is very much like a, a sort of Pulp Fiction in that sense, or at least how I feel about Pulp Fiction in that, all right, we've laid a great foundation here. I look, for, I, I look forward to the Jackie Brown, the superior Tarantino film. Anyway, just a consistently extraordinarily impressive oppressive uh work here i was engrossed by pretty much every second of it well i mean i'm not gonna come around and say that i have a take i don't uh it, it's been put much more uh, eloquently and uh, enthusiastically by tyler and sarsha but um i i guess i will speak to the, the 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 few tiny itty bitty things that does hold this back from being something that I would consider you know like a like a classic basically is that um, first of all uh, purpose of pain uh, I, I get the like the purpose of it thematically and I get the um, you know the the sound play with it and uh, I liked kind of how the comparison that Tyler specifically brought up that uh recording thing that he mentioned on the Autecker episode we had um that said it's like just long enough to be kind of inconvenient when listening to the album to the point where it's just like I'm just gonna fucking delete this so I can listen to like the album because it's like I'm just kind of sitting there like yeah yeah it's it's repeated I uh huh, and then it, it's it's basically just because well the banshee and I lie here buried fucking break down your front door and beat the shit out of you. Um, I think one thing that like yeah it's it's definitely a step up from uh, God has nothing to do with this, which is an album I already loved. Um, it's also just like production on that album was really tight and it was really groovy and it had this sort of it just sort of had this special little timbre about it that was like, it was really aggressive too. But the difference here is how full the mix sounds. Like on the previous album, there's, you know, those songs that are a bit more like, uh, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of, which is the one that uh, Ada Rook provides the um, uh, guitars for on God Has Nothing To Do With It. Um, that is, uh, I believe, 
is it black magic is it that song i think yeah, you're I think, right i think it spells us all with devi i think that magic is song with ada yeah oh well actually I, either work here is that it's just sort of like punctuated by these moments of of heaviness in like a sort of normal if a bit you know eccentric beat whereas every single beat here is just overwhelmingly flattening like huge maybe with the exception oddly enough of blood in the water the clipping beat uh which is a good song um i will say it's it's kind of my least favorite part of the album in terms of songs proper. Um, I like the song. I think it's good. I think the lyricism's great. Um, but in terms of what it contributes to the album, it's a little bit of a pace breaker in terms of what I was talking about, that like fuller sort of sound that it's going for. It's just like, you know, obviously not trying to disc clipping here, but uh, Miss uh, Backwash did a really good job at producing this album. And I just kind of prefer her production a little bit more, um, <laughs> which is, you know, I, that's, 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 wow. that's a big compliment. So take really take that, that for compliment, Miss Wash. <laughs> um, the, the one thing, I don't know if this has been spoken on yet, uh, but uh, I will say, um, while I Lie Here Buried With My Rings and My Dresses is one of the best songs on the album, I am going to hard disagree with Tyler and say that it is not Head and Shoulders the best song on this album. And that goes to Burn to Ashes, the closer, which incorporates a Godspeed You Black Emperor sample. Because Godspeed at album's end, you might say. <laughs> you got it. Um, no, 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 no. But, but, but for real though, when that sample kicks in, it's just like, but like, like when you listen to this, the album that's actually on, it's like fucking, you, you fucking float out of your bed or wherever you're listening to and you're like, oh my God. And this is like, you descend into the deepest pit of hell. And yeah. you're like, it's the great it's thing so about that, like fucking rad. The great, it's such like an oppressive album. And then you get to that song and there are moments of huge open space, right? Yeah, to yeah. the album out. Just is such yeah. a wonderful pacing choice to end it like that. It's why the production on Backwash's part is what strong, uh, what strikes me uh, so much about this record is the how heavy and big and oppressive and how it like, I mean, this is an industrial hip hop album that has, that is produced like a metal album and not like a hip hop album, which I would say the last record was produced like a hip hop album with like metal tendencies. Whereas this is like a, like near fusion of sensibilities from genre and like I I really feel like you can pick and pull from so many different genre descriptors and labels that at this point she just kind of has her own thing going on like mm -hmm. it, it's definitely something that people like uh clipping have explored or you can go far back and look at something like Dalek or even with a delivery here this is like um, like, I, I the, the powers of, that be era death grips I, I thought of, uh, was I something thought of, that um, reminded me. horror at multiple points uh, in this yeah. um, as well who obviously were on the most recent um, uh, clipping album as well um, yeah I think there's a lot of I think in many ways this feels like and this is a genre that I mean it gets dominated in discussion so much by clipping um, because of mm -hmm. their like cultural um, relevance I guess but like in many ways this record feels like a staple for horrorcore in many ways mm -hmm. like it is that through and through in the sense that it has um, you know in both in terms of the way that it sounds in terms of what it borrows from classic industrial music um, mm -hmm. but also in the sense of the things that Backwash is speaking about the kind of metaphorical links that she draws between certain um, you know uh, sources of oppression sources of suffering and then yeah. the um, you know, the death metal-esque representations of those in, you know, violence uh, and more kind of like, you know, uh, ridiculous violence and, and stuff and, and the imagery and stuff. So like it, it's, it's beautifully uh, classic in that regard in terms of horrorcore and also distinctly defined by Backwash's own perspective on these particular topics and her own experience as well. Yeah, I, I really think that like, if you call, if you compare it sort of like as in terms of like genre contemporaries, if Clipping is Metallica, then Backwash here is Slayer. I, I think there's just like, there is a consistent edge that is present here that is not like, it's not not present with Clipping, but I feel like this is just sort of a refinement, sort of a like, 
you know, clipping is su super like prescient in the genre and deservedly so, obviously I love clipping. Um, but that said, it's not exactly a genre that is full of contemporaries, that is full of like all these things. It's like, we have these like the really big outfits in that are sort of orbit industrial hip hop and horrorcore, And then like a thousand other people that nobody's heard of. Yeah, that's and... what I was gonna say. They're all underground. Like that's I think part of yeah. the reason why, why she incorporated the, um, the censored dialogues feature for instance or the surgery head feature not that they are horrorcore artists but she does with the increasing platform that she's gaining she is like using a lot of that to incorporate other voices from that very underground scene and with the success of these acts it, i mean i think there's a very real possibility that we might see a new kind of wave of this kind of underground style of hip hop oh god i would i would love that so much man well, i i, I, like, see, I see the yeah. success and the popularity and the online presence of artists like Backwash to be the first necessary step in that happening. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. It's so, um, so in keeping with um, the yeah. most recent Black Dresses album too, which, uh, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I need more of these. And I'm pretty sure on that exact episode, I was just like, I want more people to do shit like this. And then Backwash, I mean, I mean, it's, interesting. Whole... it's interesting that with the Black Dresses, those uh, two, in the musical output, although they are definitely like an industrial band, have borrowed heavily from hyper pop in their past, right? Mm -hmm. And that's an album that exploded online through not dissimilar means, right? And Black Dresses at times have straddled the divide there. Mm -hmm. um, well, that, I mean, that, you've got, you got to remember, with, yeah, sorry. That touches into, I think, like the extent to which all of these, a, very, a lot of these related sort of musical styles are all kind of tied into the queer scene, like the queer underground scene, right? Um, Absolutely, and, and, yeah. And horrorcore is becoming a big part of that, this kind of industrial, uh, lo-fi, but also very industrial, yeah, I've already said industrial, but like that sort of thing, whether it's happening in the hip hop realm or whether it's happening in the kind of PC-esque uh, digital mania realm of black dresses these are all kind of becoming a, a, a part of a wider fabric of underground or alternative music that's kind of rising to the fore in online culture um, and so mm -hmm. you see you see the the rise of hyper pop is the kind of presage to this and then the, um, these kind of subsequent waves have kind of evolved uh, in terms of following that and and so that's why I'm, I'm hopeful for the continued evolution and the continued rise to prominence because I'm sure they're probably um, a, a number of artists who are doing work as impressive as Backwash right now that we simply aren't aware of because of how underground a lot of this is. So my hope is that mm -hmm. within the next few years, we'll see more of these people kind of rising to the point where we're becoming aware of them and we're being able to talk about them. Absolutely. I mean, look, you've got to remember clipping, like, one of those guys is in fucking Hamilton, right? Like, um, they are big in other aspects, you know, they're big in just... Japan. <laughs> um, something I want to touch on actually, like Backwash has talked a lot about her love of atrocity exhibition by Danny Brown, and that influences way more on this record than anything else I've put out previously. Mm. Um, not just in the production, but in the lyrics as well, like in the focus on coping through substance abuse, through mental health, that kind of thing. Yeah, that, that uh, ties into that. another track I was going to mention, Nine Hells, as well. I'll get back to that though. Sorry, okay, keep yeah. Oh, no, I, I was basically done. Like, it's there and not only the lyrics, but the way in which it talks about that uh, subject. And we, I think we all love a Josty exhibition. Um, and that influence is, like, totally there, you know? Yeah, in many ways, it, that feels, that record itself probably feels like a significant moment in the rising um, cultural prominence of, of a more industrial-influenced um, style mm. Of a very particular brand of alternative hip hop music. Um, a couple of other things I just wanted to mention with regard to this record. We talked a lot about the production. I just want to bring up a couple more things in terms of um, the performance of Backwash herself. Uh, one thing we, we've talked about clipping a lot because they're just they just have, they just come up. Whenever you're talking about Arakor, you can't really avoid bringing them up. They're such cultural figureheads. But one way that I think Backwash clearly differs from that artist and maybe probably most other horrorcore artists I can think of is just how intimately personal she gets in these songs in terms of the things she's talking about. She's not crafting narratives. She is um, just kind of, 
you, you can tell when you closely inspect these lyrics that they're very carefully worked on. Like she has, re one thing I want to bring up is how great her flows are on this record. She has fantastic flows and she has a, a, a fantastic command of her performance in terms of how she delivers her raps. Um, but also the thing, the way that she raps in terms of the, the way that she writes is very confessional. Like she makes direct references to members of her family. That was obviously a big part of the last record as well and continues here. She just very explicitly talks about her life and her experiences in a way that is not guarded, that is not dressed up in storytelling. That is not, um, you know, what we might expect to be present, the way we might expect it to be presented in terms of the way that a lot of artists present these aspects of their, how they're feeling in their life through these, um, you know, beautiful, metaphor or whatever backwash is incredibly direct and just uh, again confessional i think is the way of describing it on this record it all comes to a head on burn to ashes which i'm glad um jake brought up because i mean the first thing that you notice about that track is is how intense it sounds and that sample is obviously so iconic and bore as fucking hell but also this is the moment on the record where i think um, and fittingly for the closing track as well Backwash is at her most frantic and urgent. In many ways, her performance here is a culmination of the way she's performed across the entire record. She just goes off. Like she absolutely, in many ways, it reminds, speaking of Danny Brown, like the way she performs on this track and, and a lot of the, the things she talks about reminded me of the closing track on Triple X, just in terms of like the intensity of the way it builds. And she's talking about suicide and stuff. Um, I got to wrestle with most of myself from holding the rope, holding the belt is the opening line of this song, right? Basically, and it only just goes deeper and darker there. There's um, how do I cast the evil out in there? How does how this compares to the weep and despair, punch in the wind, kick in the air, uncomfortable feelings, split in my hair, humble beginnings, feeding the beer. She just goes on and on and on. And she flows so uh, immaculately that you just get swept up in it and it's like surrounding you with these very vivid and dark images of what she is experiencing of her kind of psychological hell and I feel like that's a difficult thing to do in a really controlled way like a lot of people will go about trying to communicate that by writing really eloquently and elegantly and getting you and you infer all that but backwash writes in a very direct and confronting way but she does it in a way that's so um controlled as well that it, it it's truly the mark of a great performer and a great songwriter and um i agree one, one more thing as well in terms of like potential weak points on this record i obviously disagree that uh, I, I blood in the water i don't think is the weakest moment on this record and mostly because i think it feeds into a continuing theme of um, the malevolent god uh, figure or the malevolence of religion that she's carrying through, particularly in the central part of this record. So I think it fits nicely into that. The only track I would say is maybe slightly uh, less essential is the track Nine Hells, which is a good song. Uh, it's specifically about um, drug abuse and uh, falling into drug abuse as a way of coping. And it's got, again, she's really great on this track and, and writes really well. But to me, if there's one moment on this record that stands out as perhaps not in step with the rest of the album as much, it would be that song. Um, but I can't fault it too much. It's a nice kind of penultimate track that kind of gives you a bit of a breathing space, relatively speaking anyway, before that closer. Um, but yeah, overall, I think that what Backwash has created and crafted and assembled is, um, is frankly surpassed my expectations. Yeah, yeah. I'll shut up after this. If I, my only complaint is that just I had a very personal connection to the lyrics on "Got Nothing to Do with This," which well, the lyrics are great. I just I don't have that very intimate relationship to it, but they're still great. Like I can't really moan. Anything else right. you want to say? Yeah, I want to actually talk about what I think about it. Uh, yeah, I uh, I do as oh, I kind of, it. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, as I kind of alluded to earlier, I like the greater focus towards structure on this album. I think that's like immediately that's the biggest improvement i really like the way the guitar sounds throughout this album there's a really droney almost skull drilling presence to how it sounds it's really cool 
uh, and I love in the way the during the title track where the beat has just gotten so loud it like clips in the mix towards the end and completely overwhelms it. That moment is awesome. I love the storytelling and lyricism in Terror Packets, which is probably my favorite song on here. I think the the very purposeful choice to kind of split this track in two really added to a lot of the punch it had. Uh, and I, I did think the noise section on the, towards the end of In My Holy Name was a little poorly handled. I think it maybe should have faded in for a couple seconds longer to have been better incorporated into the mix because to my ears, it just kind of comes out of nowhere. Um, but I think, yeah, uh, it, it, uh, it has its minor issues. I still, uh, as I said, wish those shorter tracks weren't there. I still wish those weren't there, but I think this album is still doing, as has been said, such a, a good job to build on what has come before that now this is definitely a much better project and I, I may not be be chugging the backwash Kool-Aid as it were, but I am certainly taking my healthy sips of it with this album. I love backwashed Kool-Aid. <laughs> my favorite flavor of that. Ah! Favorite tracks and ratings <laughs> for Backwash's uh, new record. Oh. I lie here in the ground um <laughs> dead. Here, here dead. on the ground it's dark in here let's <laughs> Back, backwash's new record i'm dead um it's more than tears uh, all right my three Enough. favorite songs are burn to ashes i lie here buried with my rings and my dresses and terror packets least favorite track i'm just gonna say the purpose of pain because the rest of the album whips uh 8.5 all right, favorite tracks here are um, Terror Packets, uh, the title track, and I will throw on uh, the last song, which I forget the name of. It's Burn to Ashes. Burn to Ashes. Me and August having the same three favorites. Let's go. Yeah, let's go. Uh, least favorite is In My Holy Name. I would give this a 7 out of 10. Luis. Morgan. My three favorites are uh, Song of Sinners, uh, Nine Hells, and the title track. Um, my least favorite, I will also say Purpose of Pain. Um, I think it's a good intro, but it do be kind of going on a little bit long. And I will I will also give this an eight and a half. Bitches like Federico Fellini. Got an eight and a half. Well, if, we if you here. like Federico Fellini, then I, I'm Martin Scorsese, so I'm also giving it an eight and a half. Yeah, I'm about to um, Federico Fellate this album. <laughs> yeah! Hell, hell I yeah. Federico fucking die. <laughs> My my, fa my favorite tracks I lay here buried with my rings and dresses tear a pack I'm gonna start in the accent tear a pack that was that, that was like um, Davy reading fucking dialogue in Doki Doki <laughs> Literature Club oof <laughs> well no I have to watch the video I was going to anyway but um tear a packet I lay here buried with my rings and dresses and Song of Sinners and my least favorite is probably um Pub's Pain giving it an eight and a half as I said I would. Delightful. Um, my <sighs> my three favorite tracks are um, obviously the title track, which I didn't talk much about the lyricism of, but that's fine because I would not be surprised if it turns up in my favorite songs of the year list at the end of the year. It's that good. Uh, I'll also shout out, um, oh, uh, hmm, think carefully about what I'm going to say here. I'm going to throw in Songs of Sinners as well, which I think is a really stunning song. And I'm going to also chuck in uh, just to be different, because I really love this track, uh, 666 and Luke Saxa as well. Uh, least favorite track, 
probably nine hells. Uh, I give this record, I swear to God, I had this written down. I'm not just copying an 8.5 also. <laughs> wow. Just send a deviation. There's 0.67 though. I want you all to know that. Um, motherfuckers do, uh, be, no, motherfuckers yeah. do be agreeing. Hey, absolutely. Um, it's an 8.2 average, uh, which is consistent with, give me a, a hot minute, um, Temple of the Dog. Um, it never goes out inside some plus. Nice. Okay. Delightful. Uh, and now we move to our second review of the day, which is. Halloween are the landmark European power metal band. That is not an exaggeration. If ever there was a band to, dis to define a genre's sound, it was Halloween. Uh, this band originally formed in the 80s, releasing their debut EP, also self-titled Halloween. Uh, that EP was a fusion of speed metal and heavy metal. And as, as their sound developed and grew, they, deform they formed a distinct uh, sound of power metal, mostly, front mostly driven by the band's operatic theatrical vocals, Kai Hansen and Michael Wyckath's soaring guitar solos. And that essentially formed the basis of the genre with their two landmark albums, Keeper of the Seven Keys, parts one and two. After that, after that point in the 80s, after their first three albums in the 80s, Halloween effectively fell off in a pretty legendary way in the wake of a lot of mediocre, strange experiments. And with a change in vocalists, the band fell into relative obscurity throughout the years dipping their heads above the water occasionally to deliver a pretty decent album according to popular consensus but for the most part have never really quite tasted the same highs as they had with their original two lineups this album halloween serves as a reunion album of sorts it brings back kai hansen who left after their two keeper of the seven keys albums and also original and also their second lead vocalist michael kiske who left after their album chameleon in 91 i want to say that's not really relevant but Point being, this is a reunion album in the truest sense of the word. All three of the band's lead vocalists are now back on this one album, which has reportedly been in the works since about 2016, 2017, when the, when the group kind of properly reformed with this large lineup and they had done some reunion live shows and there, there were rumbles through, uh, throughout pre-pandemic that a new album might have been coming and might have been on its way. And it wasn't until fairly, recent, fairly recently in the past month or two that this album was properly announced and the world was told there was going to be a new Halloween album from this classic and new lineup of the band. And that essentially brings us to the present day with Halloween's 2021 album. And I, I think I will start off with my thoughts on this. Um, I think this album opens with a really triumphant bang. Out for the Glory is exactly the kind of song I was hoping would be on this album. It's reminiscent of a lot of their ver a lot of their longer earlier tracks like uh, Halloween and Keeper and the Keeper of the Seven Keys, very much in keeping with those songs of creating these massive sweeping epic songs, with with uh, just 
these absolutely stellar operatic vocal melodies, which are a really key part of the band's sound. And I think add to so much of the fun and delight of this band. And the just soaring guitar parts are so fun and engaging. From this first song, I was really hooked. I find a lot of these songs, I, I mean, Halloween are a cheesy as hell band. Their writing is goofy, theatrical, but I always get the sense, and especially on this album, that they're never really taking themselves too deadly seriously, which I guess could lead to, which in a worse band that could lead to this falling flat and just feeling really dead in the water. But I think what's so good here is, and what's so good about their best work is the surgical amount, is the surgical amount of passion that is put into this album to creating so much of the fun that is evoked by this. I really like, even with some of the dopier moments on here, like for instance, the third song on the, like for instance, the third song Based on the on. album, Best Time, yes, thank yeah. you. Uh, which pretty dopey, goofy lyrics, but the absolute intensity delivered to the vocals on this song, the absolute intensity of the guitar melodies just sells it full scale. And I guess that's kind of the general outline of my thoughts. I'll kind of step back for a sec and maybe get into some more specifics as we go on, but I want to hear what you all think about this too. My thoughts are brief. The sound fucking goes. Like I mentioned in our opening segment that uh, I got my driver's license this week and did a lot of driving music. Uh, driving to this album is one of the best experiences I've had driving. Like if you can go on a fast road this record, wind down the windows, but on full volume, you will just have an amazing time. I, I agree, like really theatrical sort of metal can come across real badly. Um, like it, in a, anyone, in other people's hands, this album could just be like cock rock, but this is not. They know exactly what they're doing. It's with like a uh, tongue in the cheek and a wink and they're just having a ball and you have a ball with them. And the 12 minute closer is amazing. Um, and just the whole album is so creative. Um, there's a whole song where the refrain is um, I'm going to have the best time of my life and that's so emblematic of the record where they're just having a great time um, and I, I loved it, yeah Yeah, I really uh, I really do think that the, the fun is so so well baked into this album and I think a lot of what sells that for me is that the three lead vocalists on here, uh, Kai Hansen Michael Kiske and Andy, I'm going to mess up pronouncing his last name, Andy D Dearis, Dearis. Uh, I think these three have a really great dynamic and interplay throughout the whole thing and are really just bouncing off each other in the best ways possible. Yeah, yeah. Like, if you like the kind of falsettos and crazy guitar solos and, like, a darkness song, you'll probably dig this record. Like, mm, yeah. My thoughts are also relatively brief. I I enjoyed this album. Power metal is not so much my cuppa. Probably my least favorite of the metal subgenres. I like Iron Maiden a lot. That's about it. And so it's sort of while I was listening to this, I just kind of thought, ah, damn, when's the next Iron Maiden album? It's been <laughs> oh, it's been a while um which is not fair and i will happily admit that but i also there while i enjoyed pretty much all of this album uh while it was on there there wasn't much that really reached out and grabbed me not much that really stood out from the pack of what i understand power metal to be so you know other other than just a good time while it was on i probably won't i don't know not much to report on it, really. 
I, um, I think I can maybe build a bit off of what Morgan is saying, um, because in some senses I feel similarly to Morgan, but also I think I'm getting the impression that I like this record, uh, or at least my positivity towards this record is a bit stronger, um, in that uh, I certainly, uh, so it seems, enjoy power metal more than Morgan. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't have a huge ton of reference points, but obviously Iron Maiden are so uh, you know significant that it's difficult not to think of them and the greatest endorsement i can give this record is that while listening to it it had it completely embodied the level of joy and feel and passion and sheer um you know creativity of those classic maiden records like it, it very much feels like this was taken directly out of that core late 80s era uh, where so much of the most ambitious stuff in this um, style was happening. Uh, it's not a record that is terribly, um, you know, three-dimensional or anything, but it really doesn't need to be. Like, I didn't go into this record expecting or even desiring to be, like, wowed by songwriting. Um, and I think the greatest credit I can give to this record is that uh, moments like, uh, what was it called again? Even now I've even forgotten, Best Time, for instance, um, moments like that where initially I was like this is really goofy and like okay settle down guys like the more I listened the more time I spent with the record the more affection I had for that um, because it is delivered with such gusto and they really own the goofiness of it and they don't uh, solely rely on that aspect of it to sell the song like it's genuinely impassioned like these are guys who are really delivering this particular style with as much gusto and genuine you know belief in it as you could possibly have and the actual talent that they happen to have as musicians and performers uh is what uh elevates that and is what makes that work um and, and it is a record where i struggle to have distinct feelings about tracks like it does kind of run together a little bit which i think is um perhaps the biggest kind of structural criticism i could say of this record is that it is a bit too long and it is a bit too indistinct at certain points. Uh, I would say that um, the record is at its strongest, both um, in, the, in that sort of opening stretch, particularly those first two songs. And then um, uh, later in the record as well with Robot King, which is a really a standout track, I think as well, one of my absolute favorites. And then particularly with um, the standout of the record, I think um, maybe fairly obviously, the um, 12 minute closing track, Skyfall, which is um, absolutely stellar. Uh, everything I wanted a 12 minute closer on a power metal album to be, uh, totally made <laughs> the runtime worth the wait to get to it. Um, not that there weren't highlights along the way, but it is everything a, a great closer should be on an album of this nature. It has the sweep to it. It has the sheer uh, irreverence of, a, of the rest of the record, but also it has this, such a passion to it like such a like these guys are uh the, the what these guys are doing means so much to them you can you can hear it and they have put so much work into making it as refined and uh immediately pleasing as it is like there's just the guitar solos and stuff and, and guitar lines and uh, mel melodic progressions are just so instantly classic like they're not reinventing the wheel but they're fucking copy they're they're doing the wheel so good that you're like, you know what? It doesn't matter. Just be like, damn, this wheel really wheeling. Yeah. The wheel is turning. It is, now. It's rolling, rolling, I'm just rolling. like <laughs> the bit that where I'm like the guy who's in the Big Bang Theory and the simple man's like, damn, look at that wheel. Like, yeah, it's a very good iteration of it. Mm -hmm. Tyler, I'd like you to formally cut the fact that Sarah should just included a Big Bang Theory joke. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, really, it was, it was a Coen Brothers joke, but I wanted to contextualize what I was saying. You wanted to give it more cred. <laughs> wow. Anyway. But the English Gross. dub of Stein's Gate with the Big Bang Theory shit. <laughs> Oh, oh, August, and your yeah. jokes for me and only me. Yeah. Good good one, guys. <laughs> but yes, Jake, what are your thoughts on this record? Um, uh, You know, I won't be a broken record, but I, I do very broadly agree with uh, Tyler and Morgan. That said, um, 
I did heavily enjoy this. I enjoyed it a lot more when I realized that Apple Music strikes again and added two songs to the end of my version of the album oh, that are dear. in fact not on the album, mm. uh, making it an hour and 16 that's, minutes that's long. On, that's on Spotify as well, I just want to say. Yeah, um, yeah. Hey, Apple Music, do you mind marking that shit so I can know? Um, because it definitely did improve my uh, enjoyment of the record just from if you're pacing wise. Like I know that like the difference between uh, and hour and five minutes and an hour and 15 minutes doesn't really sound like much but i think when it comes to something like this it's kind of vital um but i mean it's two, I, it's two songs so yeah i mean it's important it's 10 minutes worth of material which i mean that's a third of the backwash album so you know it's important um but i think the album that i compared this to at least when we were talking about it pretty briefly in the chat earlier this week was judas priest's firepower um not just because judas priest is very uh, analogous in some eras of their sound like this is a uh they typically just sort of go into more forms of heavy metal heavy metal with a tinge of speed metal um that said sort of defenders of the faith era priest is definitely super um uh definitely these guys are at least uh inspired a little bit partially by but sort of how this is a reunion album and how it's sort of being like it's doing really well critically and it's sort of a, a comeback of the for the vitality of the band even though they've been well, I mean like at least relatively there just hasn't been a lot of noise from them uh, in critical circles but they sort of come back with an album that really gets their attention and I would say that Firepower is the better album because Judas Priest do a better job at making their sound as multifaceted as it can be they're not doing anything to push their sound um, but that's sort of the thing with Al with bands like Priest and bands like Halloween is that the best thing about them is that when you dive into them, it's their consistency that is remarkable uh, above all else. They'll have their high points, like their, their painkillers, their keeper of the seven keys, stuff like that, where it's like a notable, like these, this is the best material the band ever cranked out. But typically speaking, there's sort of a longevity that uh, keeps you coming back to bands like this. And this album definitely feels like it has that. It has a vitality. This doesn't sound like a metal band that's old. This doesn't feel like people who are just sort of like, you know, again, we sort of said spinning the wheels. Um, but this is, they're just so obviously efficient at what they do. I think, of course, the guitar playing, it's power metal. So it's going to be insanely flashy. Lots of really, really like almost gaudy um, solos, uh, guitar work wise. I think the percussion work is pretty outstanding too. Uh, the vocal performances, like imagine in your head what power metal uh, vocalist from a band called Halloween sounds like. That's what this guy sounds like. Um, and yeah. he's great. He carries the whole thing well with like, you know, he's kind of got a Rob Halford about him. He, that sort of upper register that he can reach sometimes. And generally speaking, while I wouldn't say any of these songs are going to like, they don't really jump out of me as being like, with the exception of maybe Skyfall and like two out of the three opening tracks, which I think are pretty generally outstanding. Um, there's not a moment on this uh, that's like the title track on something like Firepower, or even like something a little bit more ambitious, like the something that was on the most recent Iron Maiden album. Um, but I still have to respect the gusto of knowing what your audience wants and doing that about as well as it reasonably can be done. Um, just because like, you know, we all like it when bands take risks. We all like it when bands do something different. Uh, but there is definitely a simplicity to some bands that just, you know, they know they have a niche and they're going to play to it. And I, I respect it immensely. Um, it's a very fun album, as mentioned before. I think it's, again, it's definitely a little long for my liking. I, I would have preferred something in like the 50 minute range personally. But then again, there's not a song on here that like conversely from like, you know, I, I'm not like over the moon about many songs other than Skyfall and maybe like uh fear for fear of the fallen um but there's also not a song on here that's just like really stand out as being like oh man that one's a real clunker so it really makes the flow kind of easy but yeah this is just a really fun album that i'm really glad we got to listen to for the podcast just because this kind of metal is so it's kind of a novelty now uh and so i'm glad that this is getting the critical praise it is just because I, I want more music like this and I want more music like this to be done by people who, you know, haven't been doing it for the past 40 some years uh, because you can do cool things with it. And I like that, but you know, 
for the self-titled Halloween, this is not a case of a band coming back with a self-titled album and just being like, oh, it's a self-titled because we didn't care and we just made an album and people eat it up. And it's like, no, this is no. definitely something that the construction of which uh, there was, it was clearly very thought about. There's lots of really impressive musicianship here as always with power metal, but I, yeah, it, it's a very consistent and fun listen. Hell, it could grow on me with time, but uh, the really, oh, the only thing holding it back for me anyway is just the length, but the rest of it is just broadly exactly what you want. Yeah, I think maybe what's most meaningful about this record and like it ties into things that are the very necessary context that August gave before in terms of this being the fully reunited Halloween and essentially yeah. a victory lap and celebration of their 40 odd years as a band. Yeah. And um, so what is so um, beautiful about it is that aspect of camaraderie, that aspect of um, the genuine joy that flows through this record from these performers, um, the sense of uh, the immediacy and the sense of urgency to it all, um, that really feels like, uh, I, I mean, I haven't heard, heard any other um, Halloween records, but you can really tell this is a band rejuvenated. This is a band with a sense uh -huh. of purpose, even if their goal and their is, you know, is just to make a really baller power metal record. There's a real sense of, of everyone throwing their entire pussy into it in a way that's really um, just so um, uh, contagious when listening to it. Yeah. Um, and that aspect of the reunion and that aspect of the desire and, and what August said as well, which I think is quite important with the fact that this band spent years working on this album specifically, like refining these compositions, building them up, constructing them, deciding what to put where I do. Well, I do agree that I think the album is a tad long. And incidentally, I, the bonus, one of the bonus tracks, Golden Times, I think is, is maybe I like better than maybe half the record. And I wish they'd put that on the album and maybe ditched a few other songs because I think that was a really great track too. Um, but yeah, just, just just as an aside, yeah, to me, the the joy in this record is not so much in like analyzing composition, even though these are very uh, artfully constructed songs by absolutely seasoned musicians. It's just a feeling mm -hmm. this record gives. Uh, and, and it's a kind of ephemeral way of, you know, criti critically evaluating a record, but it just is that for me, as in terms of. I mean, that, that's kind of what you want. For, that's kind of what you want from power metal, though. It's like, well, I don't need to analyze this. I just feel it in my spirit. Yeah, they just, did put the whole pussy into it, and. <laughs> I just yeah. mean like it makes it a bit difficult to review, but um, but yeah. essentially sure, sure, that, sure, sure, that's sure. what it boils down to. It's, no, I, I hope that this album continues to make waves in, in metal circles just because like, look, I'm a ghost fan. I want more music like this. <laughs> so please, for the love of God, give this a listen if you think you're all interested because I, I you know, we, we could talk about how like we love all kinds of new, innovative, cutting edge music, but there's there's nothing that's quite as cozy of a comfort food to me as like a really good meat and potatoes metal album like this. Like the, it's just, if I it, put it on it and I'm instantly just very taken and like, all right, I'm here, let's yeah. do it. If the song bangs, then it bangs and my soul it's is true. happy. This is also uh, an official calling to, hey, uh, August, listen to Meliora by Ghost. I know yeah. this is a meme with me. This might as well be my mountain goats, but it's like, if you like Halloween, I mean, it's just like, that's just, yeah. it's just I, ghost. I, I, it's, no, I, it's yeah. the same. I, I sign, you'll love it, yeah. I, I, I have needed to for a long time. My dad's really into Ghost, and I've heard a bunch of their songs God, through. Another him, W so. for August Dad. Let's hear it for August Dad. Yeah, every single fucking time I hear about this motherfucker, he's got some fucking great take. Yeah, yeah I know. We should, we, we should we need to invite. <laughs> We need to invite him on the podcast one week just for just for the sake of it. the new between the buried and me. We'll do it for colors too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Invite him for colors too. <laughs> oh, so fuck based. Yeah. Oh, oh my god, god, absolutely. But like oh, it, it's it is definitely like in that vein of just being like, if this album hits with you, it's just like Meliora is just like, hey, every song whips. That's it. There you go. It, boom, and boom. I would I would say conversely. You also have to give your due to the Keeper of the Seven Keys albums because mm -hmm. I think those have a a very yeah similar appeal. 
and, and I, I do think the, the mentioning of groups like Judas Priest and Iron Maiden is, is very apropos because in the same way, I have to think if their albums from that from like the really classic periods in their careers, if we had if we had to review those, I, I would have to think we'd have have similar things to say about those that we have to say about this in that sometimes just that that sense of gusto and bravado and that that not really needing to to dig too deeply into the lyrics of of the songs is uh is is really something integral to a lot of the the fun and the and the spirit of metal in a sense i completely agree with that it's it, you know it's weird that this is like your version of morgan with the wolf alice album where it's like it's really more about the holistic package and not really like a single part of it or a single element that either like does or does not work or is even like traditionally super impressive it's really just more about the entire product being delivered and you make a great point if we were sitting here and we were reviewing painkiller this review would be the same it's just that we would all probably give it a slightly better score like i mm. i i just want to bring up that just as a total aside um irrelevant to anything is that on the on the first um keeper of the seven keys part one album there's a song called twilight of the gods and i have yes. to wonder, i have to wonder if that is the potential point of inspiration for stephen hyden's classic rock book uh, of the same name and then it's, i looked it up it's probably the bathory album. i was just gonna say i looked it up yeah. and then i saw that was also the name of a bathory record as well yeah uh, which itself is titled after an opera by wagner so that's a that whole sense that's a whole yeah. different thing anyway viking metal aside this album rules yeah i need to get a bathory album on a record club i might have to do that that would be interesting yeah August, have you heard Bloodfire Death yet? I have. It's okay. awesome. Let me see. Uh, I'm gonna so, I'm gonna update that fucking chart. I think that's in my top 100, actually. Hell yes, it is. Anyway, I just want to say I will be listening to that record, and I will be listening to Keeper of the Seven Keys as well. Yeah, hold me to that. I, I heard the first one. It's quite good. Mm. But yeah, I think uh, is that all we have to say about halloween's self-titled album yeah fun shit favorite tracks and ratings uh reverse order as we do for the second album we discuss yep. so i'll go first um my three favorite tracks are uh out for the glory uh i'll say robot king and skyfall um uh, least favorite track um i guess maybe the or orbit just because it's only a minute long um but i mean it's yeah they're all very much of a muchness uh, and I give this record a 7.5. Lush, well, that's me next. Um, and my favorite tracks were Fear for the Fallen um, and uh, Best Time and Let's See Rose Without Chains. But there's lots of great songs. Um, I don't really have a least favorite. They all wet. I'm going to give it an 8. We don't even have to try. It's always a best time. <laughs> you've done it search search on her right. yourself fifth consecutive album without picking a least favorite track <laughs> damn Is that right yeah apparently albums be good it's, they do <laughs> yeah i can't talk shit because i don't really have a least favorite on here either <laughs> uh, uh but my favorites are i'm gonna shout out mass pollution just because that shit goes and no one's brought it up uh yeah i'll also say uh skyfall and cyanide uh, and i give this a seven out of ten yes slightly disappointed that skyfall wasn't a power metal cover of the adele song of the same name it would it I look mean, if this band could do it or I mean, I, like if anyone so, could do it it's this Tyler, band. i made a conscious decision not to make that joke it wasn't a joke i mean it kind of was a joke but like yeah I, well at least that <laughs> pun you know yeah anyway forget it <laughs> no, it's chill. It's chill. All right, my three favorite tracks on here are uh, going to be "Out for the Glory," "Fear of the Fallen," and "Skyfall." 
least favorite, I'm going to say, yeah, Orbit. And uh, I'd give it an 8 out of 10. Cool. Love to see it. Uh, in keeping with basically everybody, um, my three favorite tracks are uh, Skyfall, Fear of the Fallen, and Mass Pollution. Uh, least favorite track. Uh, also, want to shout out Robot King. That that song also whips. Um, Robot King. <laughs> I'll say uh, Down in the Dumps mainly because that's a late album cut. I really don't remember anything about. Uh, and yeah, I give it a seven point five. All right. Neato. Wow. Libido. So that standard deviation is zero point four. Jesus. Um, yeah. The Jams um, and Debris average. podcast. Well, hey, 7.6 average, a very slim bracket, um, including Octahedron by the Mars Vulture, uh, Throws of Joy in the Jaws of Defeatism by Napalm Death, and Death Turned to Self Titled, amongst others. Damn. Sick. All right. Well, let us know in the comments below what you think of either of the records we've discussed today uh, Backwashes, album. And Halloween self-titled. Uh, let us know in the comments if we missed anything when we were talking about these records, if you have a different take to us, or even if you disagree, let us know in the comments below. Next week, we are going to be reviewing um, two very highly anticipated records, depending on who you are. Um, Title of the Creators, uh, I'm heavily hyped and suddenly released new record, Call Me If You Get Lost, and Lucy Dacus's new album, Home Video. Oh, so stick around for those as well. Remember that we have more cool shit coming out this week. We have a record club on a classic piece of art punk noise rock um, from the band Brainiac called Hissing Pricks and Static Coat Tour. Stick around for that on Tuesday. And then Thursday, stick around for the second installment in our ongoing and heavily exciting uh, Radiohead retrospective. Well, on that note, uh, and with that all said, rock over London. Rock on Chicago, Levi's, quality never goes out of style.